Remember when I gave that long-winded explanation of how the cross-plane engine works in the Yamaha R1 and why it sounds the way it does? Well, this ain't that. But even though I don't feel like getting too technical, I still want to talk about rotary engines and how they fit into our beloved bike world. Okay, raise your hand if you heard of the RX-7. Yeah, most of you, because the RX-7 is like the most well-known vehicle with the rotary engine. Mazda really wanted you to know that they're putting rotary engines in the RX line of cars because they're so special. I mean, we've all seen the first Fast and Furious movie, and we all know that it doesn't matter if you win by an inch or by But do we all know that the rotary engine actually made its way into a few bikes too? Wait, wait hold on, hold on. Does everyone actually know what a rotary engine is and what makes them special compared to a piston engine? No? All right, so uh, here's a very brief crash course on the magic that is the rotary engine, because <laughs> these things are a doozy. A conventional piston engine makes its power by taking a piston and pulling it down while opening an intake valve, which allows air and fuel in the form of a mist to flow into the combustion chamber. The valve closes, which reseals the chamber, and the piston then returns upward and compresses the air-fuel mixture to whatever ratio the engine was designed with. At optimal compression, the spark plug creates a spark that ignites the compressed fuel and air, creating an explosion that forces the piston back down, which serves as the main force that drives the crankshaft. The piston then comes back up while the exhaust valve opens and pushes out the exhaust into the exhaust pipes. The cycle repeats. It's a proven design that has had the R&D time of over a century now and needless to say we've gotten pretty damn efficient at building it. The Wankel engine, because that's the true German pronunciation, not Wankel. The Wankel engine was actually thought up by a German engineering prodigy, Felix Wankel, who was born way back in 1903. In 1924, he had conceptualized the Wankel engine, and in 1929, he had received an official patent for the design. I mean, look at this guy, thinking up brand new types of engines at 21 years old, and then actually designing them and patenting them at 26. I'm 23, and all I do is make kind of funny videos on the internet. At least I'm not a Nazi sympathizer, right? <laughs> or am I? No. After a bunch of Nazi, Hitler, capture, prison, fun time shenanigans during World War II, Felix had begun working on a Weinkel engine in the early 1950s with financial backing from a German manufacturer which led to a completed working prototype on February 1st of 1957. So 1960 hits and Felix is ready to license out the technology to manufacturers around the world with a presentation for the press and specialists in Munich. Many manufacturers did immediately end up signing licensing agreements for the rotary engine and some did so later on including heavyweights like Ford, General Motors, Mazda, Mercedes, Nissan, Suzuki, and Toyota, just to name a few. Everyone wanted a piece of the pie just in case it proved profitable to build these smooth, quiet, and seemingly reliable engines. But really, only one auto manufacturer really took the rotary engine super far, and that was Mazda. Really, everyone else just built a few, you know, upgraded a few aspects here and there, maybe produced a few limited runs of cars or aircrafts for a few years, and some even just built their own prototype engines alone, but decided, <laughs> nah, this shit is too expensive. So, how does it work? Well, the rotary engine is actually pretty easy to understand if you just look at an animation but keep your eye on one side of the rotor itself only so don't try to focus on everything at once see as the rotor spins each side of the rotor is actually experiencing three different quote-unquote strokes of a typical piston so one side can be intaking the other side can be igniting while the last side is exhausting so look at one side it intakes for just long enough until the edge of the rotor blocks off the intake port as it passes over the intake it creates a seal between the rotor and the housing itself the air fuel cannot escape into other chambers because of the apex seals that create a sealed chamber between the rotor and the housing due to the way that the rotor rotates around the shaft the rotor never actually makes full contact with the housing instead it just compresses the air fuel before the spark plugs ignite this obviously drives the rotor back around the shaft and the exhaust gases are driven out before the side that we have focused on re-reaches the intake port. Now, look at the entire unit and notice how every side is in the middle of one of the four cycles independently of each other. In a conventional piston engine, the only way to get a situation where multiple different cycles of the four cycles are occurring at the same time is to simply add more pistons to the equation and offset the firing orders. With a rotary engine, you have the ability to have one rotor create power strokes more frequently than an engine with one piston. The power output of a rotary engine will generally be higher than a conventional four-stroke of comparable displacement, setup, and size. And just like where you can add pistons to a four-stroke engine, you can add rotors to a rotary engine for better balancing, smoothness, and output. So what are the advantages of a rotary engine? Well, a rotary engine can be downright tiny and still pump out a respectable amount of power, often putting out the same amount of power of a four-stroke of about three times the physical size and twice the displacement. The rotary engine also has much less reciprocating parts than a conventional engine, which you know naturally gives things much less opportunity to wear down or break. Because with a piston engine, you have camshafts, you know, spinning valve springs, just and these 
the heavy metal rods and fish is everything is just oscillating and shaking back and forth like controlled madness. So with the rotary engine, you really just have the rotor and the shaft moving around. Because of that and the way that the rotary fires, they tend to rev higher and get more power out of higher RPMs. I mean, have you ever heard the Mazda 767? That thing sounds like a full-on Formula One car. The 767 is just running a four-rotor engine. With a piston engine, you need 10 or 12 pistons to get a noise like that. Okay, okay, so I wanted to discuss two bikes that the rotary engine had made it into. And there were obviously more rotary powered bikes, but I want to discuss these in particular. The first bike in question is the Suzuki RE5, produced from 1974 to 1976. It looks like no other motorcycle in the world. It works like no other motorcycle in the world. It even sounds like no other motorcycle in the world. Introducing the rotary engine Suzuki. Rotary engine power, smoothness, simplicity. The rotary engine Suzuki, like no other motorcycle in the world. The RE5 was particularly special because not only was it one of the very few rotary powered bikes to be produced, it was actually the only rotary powered motorcycle of the Japanese Big Four to reach full production as the other three had completed prototypes but never actually committed to bringing a rotary bike to the public. See, Suzuki saw the merit of rotary engines in the world of motorcycles simply by virtue of what they do better than an actual piston engine. I mean, remember. They're smoother, they're lighter, they're smaller, and they can get a respectable amount of power out of small displacement sizes. Now, just think about a motorcycle. Everything about a motorcycle is smaller and lighter than a car, so including the engine, which means you have to efficiently extract power from smaller engines. After Felix Vankel had shared his creation with the world, Suzuki had considered creating a rotary power bike for the mid-1960s, but they wanted to continue to perfect their rendition of the technology. In 1970, Suzuki was confident enough to obtain licensing rights to produce and sell rotary engines from the German manufacturer that Felix Vankel had worked for. After two years, Suzuki had working prototypes of their future rotary bike, but still wasn't quite ready to release them to the public. In fact, Suzuki took two more years to test the bikes before finally launching them in 1974. During the creation of the RE5, Suzuki had made great strides in the production of the rotary engine. The materials used and the process for machining its components. In fact, they were so confident that they patented a few of these techniques for plating the surfaces. The RE5 was running a seemingly simple single rotor 500cc engine but it was actually quite complex and ugh, heavy. I didn't mention this yet, but rotary engines produce quite a bit of heat and require an efficient way to deal with said heat for engine life. See, Suzuki really jumped through a lot of hurdles to have their rotary engine run at acceptable temperatures. To reduce the very high temperatures of the rotary engine, Suzuki had to use liquid cooling. The engine oil both lubricates and cools the internals of the rotor itself, and coolant will cool the outside of the engine via extremely complex machined water jacket systems that pass all around the rotor housing through pumps and radiators with fans. And aside from the engine oil that's sat in the oil sump that I previously mentioned, there was actually also another oil tank under the seat that kind of metered and injected oil into the carburetor, kind of like a two-stroke. And this was done to lubricate the apex seals inside of the chamber to reduce heat and wear. The gearbox also had its own oil supply separate from the engine, which added to the complexity of the Suzuki rotary engine. See, the rotary car guys have already pretty much accepted that rotary engines run toasty like lava-flavored hot pockets, but at least with a car, you're behind a firewall with the engine several feet away from you while you're blasting the climate control. On a bike, the only thing really separating you from that flaming hot Dorito is gasoline and Balls. So the heat solutions didn't really stop there. Suzuki had to find a way to cool off the exhaust gas too because the gas would leave the chamber at about 1700 degrees Fahrenheit. So Suzuki actually used coolant fins on the exhaust manifold and split it up into two exhaust pipes despite using only a one rotor engine. You had to use the inner and outer pipes on the exhaust pipes so you don't disintegrate if you accidentally touch the damn things. On top of this, they actually had to use a sort of air injection system so that fresh air would enter the pipes and channel through it to help cool the exhaust. <laughs> the exhaust literally had an intake. And even then, Suzuki still decided to put shields on the exhaust. How was the bike kitted out otherwise? You know, whatever. Besides the engine. Well, it had a digital gear indicator, which was pretty cool for the early 70s. It had a carburetor that no normal motorcycle mechanic could work on because it was more akin to a rotary-powered car's carburetor. Great. Oh, but um, this super fancy pop-up instrument cluster that would go pow, flip open when you turn the key. Okay. All right, look, the RE5 may have been a technological marvel when it came to shoving a rotary engine into a bike, but I think you do get the point now, right? I mean, okay, so the engine was new and funky and cool and ooh, it has no pistons, but, but for what? 
You know, like we, we know a small rotary engine can make the same power in a small package as a big piston engine, but power equals heat. So Suzuki couldn't really make this thing super fast because you don't want to turn a guy basically sitting on top of the engine into roast beef. So it made a rather tame 62 horsepower, which was all right. The problem is that once again, this thing was fat too fat for 60 horses. You know, like all that stuff made to cool the bike off actually just ended up making it real heavy and expensive to boot for everyone involved, including Suzuki. Now what? I mean, the frame and the suspension was actually pretty run of the mill too, besides the like the fascinating engine. So despite all the effort, in fact, there may have been a little bit too much effort due to all these factors, the RE5 didn't actually sell well at all. And it was dragged behind the barn and put down after only three model years from 1974 to 1976. Other small manufacturers had built their own rotary powered bikes, but never quite produced them in large amounts like Suzuki did. But in the 1980s, Norton had tried their hand at creating their own rotary powered bike, which came to be known as the Norton Classic, released in 1987. The 1987 Classic is important to discuss because it was a complete paradigm shift in comparison to how Suzuki handled the problem of rotary heat over a decade before it. See, Suzuki went with very complicated measures to deal with the heat and the fueling of the engine, while Norton kept things extremely simple. David Garside was the engineer behind the Norton Classic, and his design philosophy was to use straightforward solutions to problems. For example, naturally the ignition and exhaust side of the housing of a rotary engine will run much hotter than the intake and compression side. Remember that super complex cooling system that Suzuki used? Well, Garside argued that with 580 cc's of displacement and with two rotors splitting the load, the Classic would only need air cooling so long as it didn't exceed the power level of 80 horsepower. The inside of the rotors were actually cooled using a ram air system. The header pipes were also hot, but they were instead simply tucked under the engine and contained inner and outer pipes. Remember those super complex car carbs that the, <laughs> that the Suzuki was running? Well, not the Norton. Remember how the Suzuki had three oil systems? Well, the Norton only had one. Finally, the Norton was faster, lighter, and cheaper to make than the RE5. The thing is, they only made 100 Norton Classics, so it couldn't really catch on. They then built the next rotary bike called the Norton Commander, which brought liquid cooling and a full-on fairing to the table from 1988 to 1992. The Norton Commander was initially made for police use only, but was later brought to civilian markets, with a measly 253 units produced across both markets combined. Hell, Norton even built a full-on race bike for the 500cc Grand Prix racing class that was powered by a two-rotor engine, with the Norton F1 being the road-going derivative simply made to homologate the technology on the track winning the British Formula 1 Championship and the Shell Oil Sim 50 Super Cup Series. This factory prototype doesn't have the quality finish one can expect from the customer's bikes, but the character of the machine still shows through. People know about the Norton, it's a rotary engine. But the F1 has got a brand new version. Like the Commander, it's 588cc, twin rotor, water-cooled. Driving through a brand new 5-speed gearbox. Rear suspension, adjustable for bump and rebound, is by a remote reservoir spring damper unit. At the front, suspension is also about white power and uses upside down forks with adjustable damping. The big brakes are easily capable of handling the bike's performance, but still give the rider plenty of feel for road conditions. The engine output of 100 horsepower the, the problem is that Norton honestly wasn't big enough to make the rotary catch on in any capacity. In fact, the Norton Commander was the last produced rotary bike ever, with the final production year being 1992. So what exactly is wrong with the rotary engine and why doesn't it work too well in bikes? Well, <laughs> I purposely withheld most of that information until now because I wanted those who didn't know much about the rotary engine to see the merits of the engine type first. First off, they aren't too efficient in terms of emissions because oftentimes all of the fuel doesn't ignite before it's time to exit the rotor housing and unburnt fuel ends up shooting out of the pipes. This is also a big con on rotary cars <laughs> or a pro if you like shooting flames. This also means that fuel economy isn't as good because there are more chances for air or fuel or exhaust to get into the wrong places which will eventually just sap the power. Sealing off the different chambers of the rotor is difficult because of the temperature differences between the side that is constantly flowing cool air and a side that spends its whole life exploding. See, metal expands at different rates under different temperatures, and thus the apex seals have trouble sealing perfectly for the entire system, which will inevitably wear them out, requiring replacement at intervals. To slow this wear down, rotary engines have to be lubricated excessively inside the chamber, which of course means that copious amounts of burned oil, which sucks for the sky, get shot out of the exhaust pipe too, along with the unburnt fuel. And then there's that extreme heat problem, which we spoke so much about. It's it's truly unfortunate, but only one manufacturer has really made the rotary engine viable in cars, let alone motorcycles. It's an interesting idea to build a rotary powered bike even now, but efficiency problems, much like those faced by the two-stroke engine, means that it's even less likely to see a mass-produced rotary engine in the 21st century, because there isn't really any reason to make such a thing happen. 
all we can really do is look back and just think about what could have been. This is why I'm so interested in older bikes, because less regulation and less perfected concepts means that manufacturers would try everything, even something as crazy, as unique, and as cool as a rotary-powered motorcycle. Thanks for watching.